بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم آه الان آه سنبدا مع الجلسه الجلسه الرابعه لهذا للمدرسه الشتويه العنوان الجلسه سيكون حول الثقافه ودور الثقافه او دور الاجتماع في حضاره الاسلاميه ولكن اخترنا ان يكون موضوع ب أسس الثقافة والمجتمع في الحضارة الإسلامية الذي سيرقي دكتور حسين يلماس من جامعة جورج ميسون الأمريكية هو كان معنا في السنة الماضية وطلاب استفادوا كثير من محاضرته واليوم إن شاء الله سنستف... سنستفيد من محاضرته ولكن محاضرته سيكون بالانجليزي وطبعا سيكون لدينا ترجمه من انجليزيه الى العربيه من جهاز الزوم او جهاز تليفونكم دكتور حسين يلماس the floor is yours and uh, if it is possible to give short information about your biodata they know but you with your from your Uh, on uh, words, you know, if it is possible. Thank you. Is it broken? Assalamu alaikum, good afternoon, and first I would like to thank Professor Idris and all the organizers of this winter school. This is my second time, um, and I'm excited as in the first uh, time. And I also would like to congratulate the University of Sharjah for organizing this fantastic uh, winter <clears throat> school, which I see uh, getting more interesting and um, exciting, uh, having seen the topics. My name is Hussein Yilmaz. Uh, I'm a historian of the Ottoman Empire, and I'm an uh, intellectual historian. My focus um, has been so far on uh, political thought. Uh, my latest book is on the uh, transformation of the idea of the caliphate uh, from the Abbasids into the Ottoman uh, Empire. I teach at George Mason University. So today I will go over Uh, the cultural and social foundations of Islamic civilization. And as you can see, that's an immensely vast topic that we cannot cover in one lecture. Perhaps we need a full year of uh, series of lectures uh, for that. But I will just highlight certain uh, areas of uh, how Islamic uh, civilization formed and which social and cultural uh, institutions and foundation it relied uh, upon. And then we can unpack uh, those based on your Uh, questions. But before, uh, as I outlined uh, in the lecture uh, summary, I'd like to first say a few things about the very concept of civilization, because it is used very extensively in Islamic studies and uh, elsewhere. It also became now the mainstream uh, designation of world history. We call it Western civilization, Islamic civilization, world civilization, uh, etc. So just a few words uh, on how this 
um, designation or category uh, came to the fore as an analytical framework uh, in which we think uh, through in analyzing certain contexts, uh, such as how uh, Muslims um, uh, put their cultural and social output um, historically. But I'll start, I would like to start with a question to uh, trivialize uh, the very concept of uh, civilization. Imagine uh, that in the 11th century, uh, there are two universities, one in Bologna in Italy, one is in uh, Baghdad. And let's say this half is studying in Bologna, this half is studying in uh, Baghdad. And someone came uh, to uh, doing a survey and asked the question about your opinions uh, on Aristotle. All right. So let's see, you guys are uh, studying in Bologna and someone asked you, what do you think about Aristotle? What would you say? Imagine yourself in the 11th century. And at the time when the European universities were just being built, right? Mm -hmm. There is no university in the 10th century in Europe. What would you say about Aristotle? Speak up. Good philosopher, you would say. Okay. You are Bologna. Okay, go ahead. Exactly. Exactly. One response would be, who? Who is he? And the second response perhaps would be, oh, he's a pagan. Uh, he's polytheist. He's banned. Uh, we don't know about him. Right? What about the students in Baghdad? What would they say? The first teacher. Uh, so all the students in any Muslim madrasa or learning circle uh, in the Muslim world at the time would know, uh, regardless of whether you are in the Sufi track uh, or you are a, one of a katib in the bureaucracy, uh, or whether you are a faqih, doesn't matter. You know Aristotle very well. And you don't think of Aristotle some alien figure. Uh, you, your view of Aristotle is as a monotheist. Uh, you know he is philosopher too, uh, but Aristotle is very much part of your own tradition, your learned and cultural. That's what is important here because uh, in our current world histories or books on world civilization, what do you see? It's Western civilization starts from ancient Greece, uh, right? And then goes into uh, the so-called dark ages, the ancient Greece is where uh, the foundations of Western civilization was, were laid. Uh, and then dark ages so-called taken over by um, Christianity uh, and then Renaissance, rediscovery of uh, ancient Greek heritage, including its art and science and philosophy. Uh, and then enlightenment, uh, which was supposed to be built upon uh, that and continues. Uh, and all Western thought and science and civilization or culture is traced exclusively to ancient Greece, but it's totally made up until way into 11th century where uh, Italian uh, humanists uh, were first acquainted uh, with Aristotle through the intermediates of Muslim philosophers, uh, such as Ibn Rush, they had no idea uh, about ancient uh, Greek philosophy. They had, uh, but as some, some sort of heretical field, uh, it was quite uh, banned. Uh, and then when they reconnected uh, with the uh, Greek heritage, they absorbed it. Uh, they actually uh, inappropriated it. Uh, so they now claimed Greek is uh, part of European heritage, uh, right? On the contrary, uh, from uh, around that time onwards, Muslims uh, in general now uh, more or less put a distance uh, between themselves uh, and the Greek heritage. Uh, 
uh, despite the fact uh, that uh, if we leave aside uh, Greek literature, almost all of uh, the known Greek scientific and philosophical corpus was fully incorporated uh, into the Arabic and Islamic learning uh, in the Abbasid times. Uh, it was reworked, reinterpreted, used, not entirely uh, transported uh, and imitated, uh, but greatly reworked uh, in a critical uh, way. And Muslim scientists and uh, philosophers and scholars developed their own uh, ideas about human beings, about nature, um, about uh, <clears throat> social ideals, about culture, arts, um, etc. So it was very much part of uh, Muslim heritage. So Greek philosophy and science, whether we like it or not, that's a different question is very much part and parcel of uh, Muslim heritage more than uh, European heritage, uh, right? So let's put it that way, just to uh, show uh, the complexity uh, of this uh, question. So civilizations uh, do not form uh, in isolation of each other. Uh, there are broad contexts uh, in which there are multiple linguistic, cultural, um, strains uh, which contribute uh, to the formation of any uh, civilization and Islamic civilization uh, was not uh, <clears throat> was not was no different. However, here I would like to say a few words on the very concept of uh, civilization. Why do we think through the concept of civilization uh, nowadays? Because it is very recent, uh, right? I mean, some may trace it to. Uh, Ibn Khaldun, uh, the concept of Hadara, but for Ibn Khaldun, there was no such thing as Islamic civilization. Uh, for Ibn Khaldun, there was uh, Bedawiya versus uh, Hadara, uh, right? That's not, and for him, civilization was not qualified. Uh, it's an analytical category uh, between uh, nomadic Bedouin life versus urban uh, life, uh, which requires uh, more complex institutions and uh, relationships, uh, right? So how did this very idea of Islamic civilization uh, come to the fore, which was alien? Um, Ghazali's, um, Ibn Rushd did not have, I mean, the word Tamadun or Medinia somewhat was used again, but not uh, qualified exclusively uh, with Islam uh, at that time. So it formed the very ideal civilization formed during the time of enlightenment because of Europe's own uh, problem uh, with religion. Uh, and enlightenment philosophers uh, thinking of <clears throat> European um, uh, achievements um, to theorize and categorize it uh, in a different way, uh, right? So in the 18th, uh, century, when we first see the um, uses of the word civilization in the current uh, meaning, uh, they tended to um, portray European achievements um, as a new category uh, rather than um, as Christian uh, superiority because they had a problem with Christianity uh, too. So most, if not all, uh, leading Enlightenment philosophers <clears throat> were in process of disenchanting themselves uh, from Christian uh, thought and scholastic uh, thinking. So they thought, they uh, came up with this term um, civilization and redefined it uh, in a way which entails certain very important um, components. Uh, so we have to keep in mind that when we use civilization, those components are implied. One is linearity, uh, as if there is a linear progression of human societies, uh, right? From, from worse to the good, from primitive to the advanced, uh, right? And I'm saying this because Islamic uh, thinking, uh, quote unquote, or how the way Muslims uh, uh, thought of their own history, as you may remember uh, from uh, global histories written before uh, modernity, uh, how did they um, qualify the first generation of Muslims lived? Uh, it's called um, the age of happiness, 
uh, right? And also Saadat. So in, in Muslim um, uh, worldview, it is actually a corruption uh, from an ideal age. E every generation uh, goes for the worst. Uh, so in fact, uh, many uh, at the origins of uh, many Islamic sciences, it was this quest uh, to figure out and better understand this ideal age, uh, this age of happiness to imitate, uh, right? That's how uh, Mufassirin uh, and Hadith collectors uh, busy themselves, uh, right? But for Enlightenment philosophers, no, it was from primitive age uh, to the advanced age. Uh, so this one component was linear uh, progression. Secondly, it was rationalism. Uh, as opposed to uh, Christian theological and scholastic uh, thinking. And scholastic is not completely deprived of rationalism, but rationalism here uh, in the sense uh, that unlike uh, the medieval synthesis, uh, such as uh, Ghazali and others came up with uh, the, conf the relationship between uh, revelation and reason, uh, Enlightenment philosophers exclusively thought that, no, it's a reason. Uh, there is no such thing as uh, revelation, uh, whether you are pious or not, that's your own uh, personal uh, adventure. Uh, but it is reason, nothing reasonable or rational. If can, something cannot be rationalized, uh, it cannot be true. So truth is pegged uh, to reason, uh, human reason, right or wrong. So the entire human enterprise uh, was, um, was reduced uh, to the capacity of uh, human rational uh, thinking. Uh, now, I'm not passing any judgments here. It's just the way uh, they uh, put it. And another component was um, secularism, uh, perhaps more important. So civilization came up as a secular uh, category. Uh, so now certain achievements um, are attributed uh, to this enchantment of uh, life and thought uh, from uh, religious thinking. In religious thinking, uh, there is um, accepted truth. Uh, there is revealed uh, truth. In secularism, uh, there is no such truth until it is proven by uh, reason. Uh, it, unless it was, it could be rationalized uh, right outside the uh, field of uh, religion. And then scientism. Now, scientism also, uh, of course, uh, Al Paslan, uh, Professor Achikent, uh, yesterday uh, must have in detail uh, examined that uh, question actually what is knowledge um, and how, what is the um, ontological and epistemic significance of uh, knowledge, what it means to uh, know the truth, how it evolves into uh, a worldview, et cetera. Uh, this scientific thinking uh, now become the center uh, of uh, truth finding because there are multiple paths uh, that you could, as an individual or society, could be after truth, uh, right? It's a conviction. Uh, for example, I believe in quantum theory, but it's a belief, <laughs> right? Uh, I just believe that a bunch of uh, scientists, uh, such as Pro Professor uh, here, tell us, uh, tell me that this is, it, and I be, just believe in it. In the same way, I believe in uh, priests. The only difference is that these uh, people claim uh, that they can prove it uh, through experiment uh, and they can explain it in the language of uh, math. But uh, maybe I'm educated to have a more informed, uh, but most rest of the uh, people still, even uh, whether it comes from a scientific source uh, or a uh, theological source, uh, believing truth is still uh, believing. For enlightenment uh, philosophers, uh, so truth finding, again, here was reduced uh, to uh, science. But here, uh, civilization, along with its components, uh, such as progress, rationalism, uh, and scientism, actually replaced uh, religious thinking it was canonized, it became doctrinal uh, thinking. So you cannot, um, uh, you cannot negate, you cannot do away with science. You have to believe it. If you are rational, 
if you are secular, you have to believe in uh, science. And you know, in history of science, how many theories changed over time, uh, right? Doesn't matter. Uh, at that time, science had to be uh, believed. Uh, it's fine. Uh, as long as it is uh, confined to uh, physics and uh, mathematics uh, and engineering, et cetera, uh, that's not a big problem, which uh, the Muslim scientists uh, also had the same um, understanding. Uh, the problem here was the application of scientific thinking to civilization, uh, right? So all uh, European achievements uh, were now attributed uh, to their um, historical evolution, uh, right? So European man uh, now evolved to a stage uh, in which individuals now freed themselves uh, from the chains of uh, religion. They are free uh, in terms of their uh, thinking. They can experiment, uh, they can find the truth uh, by themselves. They don't need to be told uh, the truth. And that is used to prove European people's superiority over the others. So we are secular rational scientists and all you guys, the Hindus, uh, the Chinese, the Africans, all others are inferior because you are still told what is uh, true. You are just still following uh, that so-called revealed. Uh, so we are, uh, superior uh, to do, and they all attributed that to their own achievement. So civilization was, uh, in their thinking, an exclusive European success, not a collective human success. We did it uh, because we discovered uh, Greek science and philosophy with the Renaissance, uh, and Renaissance humanists now rediscovered nature, their own human capacity, uh, rather than still following blindly uh, the dictates of the uh, church. Uh, and then after Renaissance came um, enlightenment. I mean, enlightenment is, it is funny because it is also a religious concept, right? I mean, you can find it in Islamic uh, Sufism, you can find it in Hinduism, but they use it in the rational sense. We are enlightened with the light of reason uh, and uh, science. And that stage, um, that achieved uh, stage of uh, thinking uh, makes Europeans uh, different, distinguished, uh, superior uh, to the others. They called what civilization meant uh, in the Enlightenment was the Europe's exclusive success story. Uh, so uh, that's the problem. When uh, philosophy and science were used uh, in the service of uh, portraying uh, Europe's stage of being um, as rationalized as civilization uh, and superior to all um, others. Now, how come that affected Muslims and Muslim intellectuals and scholars reacted in the 19th century? Uh, so that, of course, they didn't know in the 18th uh, century. In the early 19th century, uh, they first came into contact with mostly French uh, thought. And then the first reaction uh, was, of course, the rediscover of Ibn Khaldun uh, and Al-Farabi and other uh, philosophers who use such uh, concepts as Hadara and uh, Tamaddun uh, or Medina. Uh, and they argued, come on, uh, what you call civilization, we know it, uh, but don't just uh, appropriate it uh, exclusively uh, to yourself. So a range of uh, Muslim intellectuals argued uh, that civilization, they believed, first of all, uh, they accepted uh, that as a, um, as a useful category, but uh, they said civilization first is not an exclusive uh, European achievement, it's collective. Uh, we contributed uh, this civilization as much as you did. So that's how um, um, that vast literature on uh, Muslim science, uh, Muslim uh, philosophy, uh, the contribution of uh, Muslim scientists uh, into uh, science 
uh, started to emerge. Uh, they started to highlight uh, Al Harazmi's, how Muslims uh, implemented uh, algebra, uh, Muslim opticians, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Muslim doctors, such as uh, physicians uh, Ibn Sina, they were all now put forward uh, to uh, prove uh, that uh, you cannot um, delineate civilization um, from the rest of the world. Uh, Muslims contributed as much as um, you did. That's the first objection uh, they put forward. And second objection was that it was not linear, uh, right? So it's not that uh, the, it might be your history, uh, but uh, considering other parts of the uh, world, uh, there is no such linear development or uh, progress. Uh, we had great scientists, philosophers and scholars, um, architects, engineers in the past. Uh, so from our perspective, it's a decline, uh, actually, not uh, a progress as in the case of uh, uh, Europe. So that was the first response of uh, Muslim intellectuals in the 19th century. Uh, and then they also started to think of uh, Islamic history as uh, a history of uh, collective civilization of Muslims, uh, right, in a different way uh, than the um, Europeans. So that's the short history of how civilization came into the use uh, among Muslim intellectuals in the uh, 19th century. In the 20th century, uh, actually Toynbee made it universal. Civilization was a very problematic concept uh, until way into 1940s, uh, 50s, because still implied um, a sense of uh, superiority, uh, civilized versus uncivilized uh, world. In the 19th century, it was used to justify slavery, colonization, um, et cetera. Uh, but Toynbee, uh, who was himself uh, a colonialist and racist and whatnot, uh, when he was uh, in his early uh, years, after World War I, he wrote a, a long history of civilizations. Uh, there, he used civilizations. Uh, so he recognized and acknowledged that there are other civilizations. They are not dead, uh, along with the European civilization. And they needed to be acknowledged and uh, recognized without uh, putting in hierarchies uh, between them. And every civilization could be different. They don't need to. Uh, have the same kind of uh, output uh, at every uh, time. So since then, uh, it became quite commonplace uh, to study and think of uh, the history of uh, societies or major uh, religions or regions uh, in terms of uh, civilization. Now, here the problem is uh, that we should be aware of uh, when we uh, still think of Islamic uh, civilization, uh, which I consider as a useful uh, category, uh, but with the knowledge uh, that this doesn't mean uh, in Islam, what we consider within the context of Islamic civilization, that everything cannot be or should not be or may not be Islamic. Uh, well, that's a big uh, problem. Um, uh, so everything Muslims do or everything that happens uh, in a Muslim-dominated uh, society cannot be uh, Islamic, uh, right? So how do you call then it's still an Islamic uh, civilization, uh, right? Uh, well, many historians grappled uh, with that question. Marshall Hudson, for example, argued that no, we can, Islamic civilization is not a good term. Instead, we should say Islamic kit civilization, a civilization that is influenced uh, by uh, Islamic elements uh, or by uh, Muslims. So in Islamic uh, civilization, when we think of it, there is certainly, it cannot be thought independently of uh, uh, the phenomenon uh, which we call uh, Islam. Uh, now take off Islam as uh, a form of piety, as practice, as learning, um, as, um, as, um, as institutions, uh, et cetera. Uh, it is part of it. Uh, but it's not the sole determinant uh, of uh, what we may call Islamic civilization. First, uh, there are many non-Muslims 
uh, still living? Uh, and it's a big question. Um, again, Al Pastor Ojam would know better. For example, Maimonides. Maimonides is a Jewish philosopher, uh, was born in Andalusia. Uh, actually, he migrated into uh, Cairo and he wrote his best works uh, in Cairo. He's the most influential philosopher in the Judaic uh, tradition. Uh, so, to what extent he is part of Islamic civilization uh, or not? Uh, that's a problem. Um, and I think it's part in the broadest uh, sense, uh, it is still uh, part of Islamic uh, civilization because he lived uh, and he, his output uh, was in uh, carries part of Muslim uh, society, Muslim institutions, Muslim learning. Uh, he read Muslim philosophers. Uh, he was well-versed in Arabic, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we can multiply these uh, examples. Uh, so not everything in Islamic civilization had to squarely fit uh, to, uh, to the legal norms uh, of uh, Islamic law, uh, right? Uh, so uh, in that loose sense, uh, we can say uh, the range of output uh, that came to the fore in engagement uh, with the broader Islamic faith tradition uh, constituted uh, Islamic uh, civilization. And I'm, now I will give you uh, just highlights uh, on a few, um, under a few headings, um, and then we can unpack, uh, as I said, um, uh, some of these um, areas. Now, in the 13th century, um, Ibn Battuta, I'm sure you all know, uh, he travels from Morocco all the way to uh, China. I, he passed through Kerala, I don't know. Maybe he did. <laughs> uh, I mean, he's one of the most amazing intellectuals uh, to my mind. I'm sorry? No, 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 no. At the end, I'll show you some uh, pictures. So at one point he passed through Anatolia and at the time the Ottoman state was just forming uh, the second Sultan uh, and nobody cared about the Ottomans uh, at the time, but luckily Ibn Battuta visited them uh, and uh, recorded. And it shows a very uh, good illustration of, of how Islamic civilization functioned uh, at the time. First, uh, he was welcomed everywhere he goes. So he's a scholar uh, by himself. Uh, so he visits, um, uh, hostels and lodges uh, operated by what he calls Fitian uh, at the time. So that's a social institution. They all welcome him. Oh, come stay with us. Uh, you're a stranger. Uh, you're a traveler. So he doesn't travel a dime. It's a good times for uh, travel. No visa, no money required. Uh, so he's just hosted. He's um, very entertained, uh, served nice food. Uh, very, and depends on where he goes because Western Anatolia at the time was still in process of being populated uh, by Turkoman peoples. Uh, and those Turkoman peoples were also in process of being exposed to learned Islam. They were mostly nomads. Uh, they didn't have much of an idea of institutional uh, learning. Uh, yes, yeah, so he was considered hailed as a uh, big scholar, so they embraced uh, and invited whatever he went. So there were uh, small madrasas uh, in Western Anatolia. Again, uh, he was invited there. Uh, he had conversations with uh, mudarrises, uh, there, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, in, in one case, uh, he's uh, hosted by one of the local governors. Uh, and then um, uh, before meal, uh, they were uh, they prayed together. And uh, Ibn Battuta was a Maliki, right? So he was praying like this. Uh, but these uh, quote unquote ignorant uh, Turkish nomads thought he, wa he might be Shiite. <laughs> and Ibn Battuta is very smart because he's been to many, many uh, different uh, societies. Uh, after the prayer to test his Faith, because it would be very, you know, rude to ask, uh, "What is your faith? Are you Shiite or Sunni?" That would be rude. They served him uh, rabbit meat, 
<laughs> because in Turkish tradition, uh, for somehow uh, the Turkish Shiites don't eat rabbits. Uh, they, I don't know uh, the sources of the uh, origins of the myth. Uh, they also think that Shiites, uh, which is wrong, but they think that Shiites don't eat rabbits. Uh, so they, <laughs> they serve the <laughs> uh, rabbit to test his uh, faith. And he says, uh, I ate the rabbit with great gesto. <laughs> and then uh, they figured that uh, I was a Sunni. Um, so he makes his uh, jokes and tells us um, anecdotes uh, too. But it shows that uh, Ibn Battuta felt, despite these uh, little gestures and tests, completely at home uh, in Western uh, Anatolia. He didn't know a single Turkish uh, word. In fact, in one other uh, occasion in a city, I think it was Denizli or something, they brought someone uh, who was known to speak Arabic very well, uh, like me, I cannot. Uh, so uh, they, he started to talk to the, uh, person uh, hoping that the conversation would be translated with the locals, uh, right? So he starts uh, speaking, but the person fails uh, to uh, translate. Um, and then uh, the person says, well, he's speaking uh, Ammi Arabic. I know uh, Fusa Arabic. So <laughs> he, he uh, portrays himself again, higher than uh, Ibn Battuta. Uh, just uh, not to be shamed in front of uh, Paul. But nevertheless, if he goes everywhere, welcomed, uh, have good uh, memories, all the way, uh, by the way, to China. Uh, it's, it's not a small feat. Even in China, uh, mostly uh, he's been hosted by Muslims uh, because at that time, um, way into uh, Chinese sea uh, in Guangzhou, uh, there were pockets of Muslim uh, communities. Uh, so they, the, the way they converse uh, with each other, they know each other, that shows something how Islamic civilization uh, form. And I will talk about <clears throat> those specific um, elements uh, now. Now, before that, two major uh, characteristics of Islamic civilization I would like to um, highlight. And this one is Islam, soon after it was born, introduced a new social order. Uh, and I'll unpack uh, what I mean uh, by that. And secondly, it also introduced a comprehensive legal uh, order uh, in a way uh, that nobody feels alien uh, or stranger. Uh, so as a Muslim, uh, when you go through Muslim societies or communities, you know what to expect. Uh, and they also know you, uh, how you would behave uh, and um, how you would act uh, in social uh, situations um, and uh, your obligations uh, as the host or the, uh, or the guest. But comprehensive legal order also includes um, other elements, uh, not just free uh, Muslims. Uh, it organizes uh, the entire society in a way uh, that the members uh, know their status, uh, their limits, their obligations, um, and their responsibilities. And that includes slaves uh, and non-Muslims uh, as well. So in that regard, Islamic civilization is a, a comprehensive, uh, legal uh, order because non-Muslims have their legal uh, status there. They were legally integrated uh, into that uh, society um, and slaves too. Slavery was not abolished uh, by Islam, but slaves were given uh, a human agency uh, with Islam. So uh, they have certain rights uh, and responsibilities, uh, right? So you know in, a, in that society um, your, your limits, uh, your status, uh, your, uh, your value um, as uh, one of the member of that broader uh, society. Now, what, that, uh, what does it mean uh, to become that uh, society? Now, I will just 
tell you three <laughs> slogans of the French uh, Revolution, which were prescribed at the time um, as totally new, uh, but they were by no means uh, new. They were just secularized um, uh, redefinition of uh, human beings. And you know, all these equality, freedom, uh, and brotherhood. Uh, that's exactly uh, what Islam, including other religious, major religious uh, traditions uh, to prescribed um, equality. So that means every person uh, who confessed Islam is equal with anyone else, uh, regardless of uh, one's uh, race um, and uh, region uh, or language, etc. Uh, they were equal. Unless, of course, there are certain absolute categories uh, in Islam. And one is, I just mentioned, uh, slave. Uh, but slave, you cannot slave at will. Uh, there are certain rigid uh, conditions. It's a different uh, topic. But every Muslim um, on uh, one's free will is equal to every other uh, Muslim. That puts you on equal uh, footing anywhere you go in the uh, Muslim world. That's how it became possible later on, I'll talk about a, a certain um, uh, student uh, could uh, come up from Morocco and takes a position in Cairo and then moves to Samarkand, becomes Qadi in Samarkand, becomes Mudaris in Baghdad, all same. Uh, as long as you have that faith, you cannot be treated uh, secondary. Second, freedom, uh, that you are free uh, and, Rosenthal, we just talked about uh, with al this morning, uh, has a book uh, on Hurriye uh, in Islam. So it's, it was Hurriye or freedom uh, in Islamic law <clears throat> and Islamic ethics uh, was uh, laid out as one of the fundamental uh, condition of being a human uh, in Muslim uh, society, even um, precise uh, your faith. Uh, because faith without freedom does not uh, count. You cannot enforce uh, faith. Uh, and brotherhood. Uh, brotherhood is not um, in a very uh, cultural sense. <clears throat> it uh, imposes you certain uh, obligations. So confessing the faith uh, puts you in a relationship uh, with other uh, Muslims and uh, Muslims, Muslims. So you have obligations uh, towards uh, those, and you have obligations uh, towards uh, yourself. And code of uh, conduct uh, that is imposed uh, upon the individual, which enables uh, that individual to get into relationship uh, in a variety of uh, communities, wherever. Uh, you could be a merchant, you could be a student, you could be, um, um, you could be a bureaucrat, doesn't matter. Uh, wherever you go, there are certain uh, set of uh, moral uh, obligations you have to uh, go, uh, go through. So that created uh, this mobility uh, within the broader uh, Muslim uh, community, regardless of these languages uh, and, um, and um, and different uh, communities, uh, etc., and identity, uh, of course. So you adopt this uh, primary um, identity beyond your local designations. Uh, you could be a certain, from a certain village, you could be from uh, a certain uh, tribe. Uh, so Islamic identity overrides uh, all of these uh, that entitles you. Uh, to engage with any other Muslim on equal uh, foot with that uh, distinguishing uh, identity. It also distinguishes you from um, other faith traditions um, around you within your own society and outside uh, the uh, society. And peace. Uh, now, in practice, uh, you might argue uh, rightfully uh, that Islamic history has its own share of violence, of course, the Muslim. <laughs> Uh, rulers uh, fight against uh, each other, uh, etc. Uh, but 
uh, there are certain conditions Muslims were uh, entitled. I'll just give you two uh, examples. Uh, in a war between two uh, Muslim uh, communities, Muslims' um, property uh, cannot be uh, taken up uh, and Muslims cannot be uh, enslaved, uh, right? I mean, that's their entitlement, uh, right? I mean, you can defeat uh, other Muslims, but you cannot take their property. Uh, they cannot take them as uh, slaves. Another example is uh, the difference between Hiraba and uh, Bari, uh, right? Uh, so when there is Hiraba, some Muslims engage in uh, bad behavior, yes, they can be executed uh, and punished uh, and their property can be uh, taken. But if legally uh, they are Bari, and Bari means someone uh, rebels or opposes um, on the basis of thinking uh, differently uh, about uh, things going on. So, uh, there is uh, an authority, uh, and then uh, you have a different uh, view uh, how things uh, should be done, uh, like most youth do nowadays. Uh, they just think differently <laughs> from their parents and uh, governments. Uh, so when they demonstrate, uh, let's say, uh, they cannot be executed. Uh, their property cannot be taken uh, away. Uh, they could be punished if they cause uh, violence uh, or disruption, uh, but they have their entitlements, uh, legal entitlements, uh, right? Um, and uh, political unity. Uh, that's uh, also very important, <clears throat> a very wide topic. I'll just um, move very quickly uh, on it, which um, uh, took its form in, uh, in the caliphate uh, from early on. Um, and then even after the demise of the caliphate uh, under Mongol uh, onslaught, uh, it continued uh, through a variety of other ways, uh, ulema, sufia, uh, networks, uh, et cetera. But that sense of uh, political uh, unity that Muslims are, regardless of their local dynasties, part of the same uh, legal order, legal and political order, never demise until the rise of the nation state uh, from 19th century on, which is a totally different uh, story. So even when uh, there were many dynasties around uh, in medieval uh, times, the sense that Muslims uh, were part of the same legal and political uh, order uh, uh, was felt uh, by themselves. And because it was through that sense of connectedness, uh, the ummah, uh, right? So ummah uh, is a very interesting uh, concept. Uh, it overrides uh, the local authorities uh, because there is a greater uh, order uh, beyond that. Whether uh, that political authority materializes or not, because it didn't uh, soon after uh, the Abbasid revolution, the caliphate was uh, broken many, many times, and the Fatimids came, another uh, setback, and then the Abbasid caliphate was uh, over. We have so many different uh, rulers, but the idea of Ummah uh, was always uh, there. And interestingly, every one of those rulers claimed to have that universal authority uh, over the broader uh, Muslim uh, community. Now, that's... Um, <coughs> That's enough for now. Uh, let's move some of those uh, components that um, I thought we will be uh, discussing. So what are the elements of uh, unity uh, in Islamic civilization? The first, and I think the most important, uh, besides uh, the faith itself, uh, is the language. Uh, without language uh, and script, uh, there is no Islamic civilization uh, or ummah uh, or unity. Uh, it all became materialized through the um, intermediacy of language uh, and its script. Now, from world history, we know that every community uh, adopts the script uh, of their sacred book. Uh, so whichever language you go into, you adopt its own uh, script. A good example is Uyghurs uh, from Central Asia. Uh, Uyghurs once um, 
uh, shamanistic, uh, so they had their own script. And then they turned into Buddhism uh, and they adopted a Buddhist uh, script uh, of the time, which is a Sanskrit script, um, I guess. Uh, and today, actually, the oldest Buddhist uh, uh, manuscripts in Sanskrit um, script uh, were found among those Uyghurs in China. Uh, and then they uh, converted into Islam, they adopted Arabic uh, script. So conversion uh, comes with its own uh, script. An Arabic script from Spain uh, all the way to China uh, became the script of uh, Muslims. Even Chinese, even in societies where which were uh, had very strong learned traditions, uh, right? I mean, Chinese Muslims had their own Chinese script, uh, which is a very well advanced script. And it was a huge literature uh, on that. You don't need uh, Arabic script to express yourself, to write books, uh, to get educated. But they adopted Arabic uh, script as their main um, <clears throat> Uh, instrument of uh, expression. Uh, but Arabic language uh, was even more important than the script uh, because it enabled uh, first uh, this sense of uh, unity. Now that the first, the first time, actually, it's not about only Islamic history, but from a world historical um, perspective, uh, the rise of Arabic for the first time um, served. To, uh, to become a melting pot of multiple civilizations, right? Uh, no other language served to that purpose. Latin language, very minimally. Uh, there is very little translation or into Latin language from previous uh, civilizations or adoption from uh, previous civilization. In Arabic now, uh, from Farsi, from, because, just before Islam, there was a vibrant Persian civilization. There was a vibrant Hindu uh, civilization, Chinese civilization, Christian Latin uh, civilization. Now, all these civilizations had major cultural um, and scientific output, uh, right? Now, uh, all the representative works of those languages were either adopted into Arabic uh, or translated uh, into Arabic. Now, think of this way. I go back to fifth century. There is a vibrant Farsi civilization <clears throat> and the Christian civilization. The only way they engage with each other is to fight, uh, which they did uh, at that time, uh, very often, uh, like Greek uh, Persian Wars, uh, we know, or the Roman uh, Persian Wars later on. Uh, but the interaction was limited. Uh, Alexander, of course, invaded all uh, area, Hellenized uh, that region, but not much came to Greek thought from Hindu civilization or uh, Persian civilization. Um, it came with Islam. Now, uh, whether they're converted or not, uh, remember, civilization is a very loose category uh, here. Uh, they started to either translate their works uh, into Arabic or started to write uh, into Arabic. Because if you are to, uh, if you want your work uh, to have some influence, uh, if you want your work to be read by a broader audience, especially um, now that um, the, um, the Muslims who speak Arabic rule over uh, this, area, you rather write in Arabic, uh, right? So this is the first time very different strains of uh, science and philosophy and literature came to be expressed in one language, right? So uh, Persians had their own scientific traditions um, or learned traditions, let's put it that way, uh, or the Hindus uh, had their own but they had very little interaction uh, between them. Now, all of a sudden, uh, it's a huge uh, accomplishment or development, uh, let's say. Now you sit anywhere um, in a major learning center, uh, be it Nishapur, 
or Baghdad or Cairo at your disposal, uh, there are books written in India, uh, in, uh, in, <clears throat> in Iran, um, in, in Greece, uh, in North Africa. It's a huge, exciting moment, uh, right? Especially in certain areas such as uh, medicine, uh, multiple uh, strains of medical knowledge now became available. Uh, that's how uh, major physicians uh, in Islamic context, such as Ibn Sina, uh, grew up. And that quickly uh, was followed up by major breakthroughs uh, in science, uh, in math, uh, in philosophy, in uh, medicine, uh, because uh, now you have a very critical uh, approach. Uh, it's not that Muslims uh, all of a sudden uh, discovered that quote unquote great uh, Greek science and then mesmerized. Uh, by it and followed it. No, uh, at the same time, they had philosophical and scientific books from other parts of the world uh, too in Arabic. They, uh, they compared, uh, they, they, they critiqued uh, those and came up with their own um, scientific um, output. Um, and then now from the middle of China all the way to uh, Spain, uh, one language, uh, for expression of philosophy uh, and science. It's the most prestigious uh, science. Even if you are not living uh, in that cultural zone, um, you would go there uh, to learn. Uh, we have, in fact, uh, from late medieval ages, uh, many Europeans uh, who travel to Andalusia or other parts to learn uh, Arabic. In fact, some of the founders of uh, Italian uh, humanism uh, new uh, Arabic uh, because uh, there is no other way. Uh, these works were not available uh, in the Latin language um, of the time. So language uh, created that uh, civilizational uh, unity and enabled people to interact uh, for the transmission of uh, knowledge uh, between uh, those multiple uh, civilizations. Um, and then we have, uh, in addition to um, Arabic, other languages started to uh, rise, not to uh, dethrone uh, the primacy of Arabic as a language of science, philosophy, uh, and law. But in addition uh, to that, uh, it first um, came up with uh, Persian, uh, right? slowly. Persian uh, started to become another uh, cultural language of uh, a large uh, region because that was historically the case, uh, right? Persian empire um, used Persian uh, from Northern India all the way to today's uh, Iraq in a very large uh, area. And in that area, there were major uh, schools of learning and school of Nishabur was still quite operational when Islam reached uh, there. Uh, so slowly, the Persian speaking um, elite used Persian uh, in areas uh, that, uh, uh, that give that particular uh, Muslim community uh, to better manifest themselves, uh, to express, especially in literature. So literature, uh, local languages started to be uh, used. Uh, that's how um, uh, from 10th century onwards um, in the Eastern uh, part of the Muslim uh, world, which extended uh, later on, uh, of course, uh, due to uh, different uh, dynamics, which uh, I'll be speaking. Persian now became the language of bureaucracies, poetry, uh, history writing, um, et cetera, uh, but in not, not in competition. Uh, with Arabic. Uh, still, Arabic continued to be the language of uh, science, uh, philosophy, uh, and uh, law. Soon after, uh, we added um, to that Turkish uh, language, especially with the rise of uh, these non-Arab dynasties. Uh, actually, it was at the root of the rise of Persian uh, too, with the decline of 
uh, Abbasid Caliphate and the rise of those regional uh, dynasties, in which case uh, the courtly elite uh, did not enjoy non-native language, uh, right? Uh, so if you're an Indian dynasty, well, especially in um, literature, you want to hear poetry uh, in your own language, uh, not in the secondary language that uh, you taught yourself, uh, right? So that's how in those uh, regions, the vernacular uh, languages became more and more the language of literary expression, uh, right? And then by extension, the ruling elite, uh, the scribes, the history writers, the record keepers also started to use those uh, local languages, but to, uh, until the 20th century, Arabic continued uh, to be the standard language of um, learning. All right. Now, <clears throat> I will talk about three major corporate groups, uh, which are more tangible uh, in terms of uh, making uh, Islamic civilization uh, possible. And these are the ulama, uh, the Sufiya, which are latecomer. Uh, and the Kuttab, uh, right? Uh, now, we are not talking about uh, some uh, professionals uh, who had their unique ways of uh, development uh, here and there. What distinguishes uh, all these three uh, groups is that they are a vast networks. Uh, so what defines um, ulama, uh, for example, ulama, slowly a uh, bunch of scholars uh, established themselves as the advocates uh, and defenders of what they called sunnah uh, and jama, right? And sunnah means in the broader sense, uh, the tradition and jama is the community, the Muslim uh, community. So they assumed themselves the role of uh, interpretation of scriptures uh, and standardization uh, of its understanding um, and then uh, adaptation of it uh, to different uh, contexts. Uh, so as Muslim society evolved, expanded, uh, engaged into more complex relations and developed more interesting and complex institutions, more complex questions uh, arose uh, and they needed to be addressed um, and resolved uh, through uh, legal thinking. Uh, and that's what ulama uh, did. Uh, but interestingly, the ulama did not have uh, a, um, have a institution per se with vested authority. I mean, there is no such thing as, um, as, uh, uh, as a school or uh, as a state agency that actually empowers uh, the ulama. Ulama's power and prestige and authority comes from its own uh, knowledge uh, and learning, because knowledge means uh, authority. And how they, they maintained uh, that among uh, themselves, it's very interesting because there is also, I don't think any other corporate body uh, in world history as efficient uh, as uh, ulama because their sole authority was self-regulated, right? You cannot just pose yourself as alim somewhere. You can, but you need something of authorization, uh, right? I mean, they would ask you, who is your teacher, right? If you can show all the teachers and texts uh, you read, then around you, you would be considered uh, as an authority based on your resume. Uh, right, your ijazah. And yes, <laughs> he's an expert on uh, ijazahs. Um, but beyond that, uh, the ulama's authority comes from a very specific use of uh, Arabic as a technical legal uh, language. Now, remember, why do we, uh, I don't know, respect doctors uh, so much? Because they speak in a language we have no idea. Uh, right? I mean, they write a prescription and say, okay, thank you very much, but we don't understand it. There are some Latin words on the paper, 
So ulama has that too. Uh, only ulama understands. Uh, it's a very, I mean, it's, le it's law. Every legal language is technical uh, and complex. Uh, it requires expertise. Uh, so that expertise in language empowers itself. Uh, others cannot understand it, uh, right? And that also gradually evolved into a stage that the language of law became standardized. I mean, that's a huge feat uh, at success. Imagine this is this community is now extended uh, half of the world, uh, right? So how come um, the law, the language of law, becomes that standardized? Uh, so the judge in Samarkand uh, and the judge in Kairawan exactly knows uh, what the language of law is. So if he has a book uh, from by a Paki written uh, in Tabriz, uh, that's entirely legible uh, to that Faki, uh, to that uh, judge. There is, there is no uh, difficulty in understanding even across different legal schools uh, between Hanafis or uh, Hanbalis, et cetera. Um, the interpretation changes, but the istilahat um, is exactly the uh, same. The usul, uh, they understand. Uh, the, uh, the reasoning, the legal reasoning, uh, they perfectly understand. They don't have to agree with each other, but the concepts, uh, the terms uh, are same. So ulema created this legal language uh, by themselves, which gave them that power. Uh, so nobody else uh, can judge uh, in, in courts because they know it. Uh, that's how uh, the secular, so <clears throat> quote unquote, the sultans, the rulers had increasing difficulty to intervene uh, with the sphere uh, of judges in the judicial uh, sphere. So judicial sphere, uh, the institution of justice, uh, the implementation of justice, almost exclusively uh, run by the ulema. Uh, the rulers only had the authority to appoint uh, judges, the qadis, but they cannot interfere uh, with their judgments, uh, right? That's self-control uh, by the uh, ulema themselves. So that created um, <clears throat> standardization, uh, standard application of uh, Islamic law across a vast Muslim uh, community. Uh, and that network also enabled a great degree of interaction uh, and transmission of uh, knowledge. Uh, you should know uh, from popular readings how fashionable was uh, those travels for ilm, uh, right? But they were not, not done just for the sake of uh, travel. It was required. Uh, so if you want to uh, become an established uh, scholar, you seek knowledge. Uh, you seek that authorization. So you go from one city to uh, another. And there is hardly any scholar that didn't go through multiple cities uh, for uh, education. So that created this um, complex uh, community in a given madrasa, for example, you might have students from many, many different backgrounds. Uh, in Cairo, for example, there might be Berber students, Turkish students, Farsi students, and Arab students, and etc. But they all speak um, Arabic. Uh, that's how they uh, reason. A similar development um, happened um, in in the spiritual field as well. Uh, in from 11th century onwards. Now the reasons <clears throat> we can talk about as a separate uh, case, uh, but from 11th century onwards, Tasavvuf uh, or um, Sufistic thinking uh, became more and more <clears throat> fashionable. Uh, one was, uh, I mean, there may be many, uh, reasons. If you look at especially where Tasawwuf spread, <clears throat> these were mostly borderlines, uh, frontier regions. Uh, Tasawwuf did not emerge uh, as an institutionalized spiritualism in the major centers of 
uh, Islamic learning. There were ascetics uh, then, Junaid al-Baghdadi, for example, he's from Baghdad, uh, right? Hujwari, uh, these are major early uh, Sufi, but these were ascetics. Uh, these were just contemplative uh, people, not so different from uh, philosophers. Uh, they had a different proclivity um, in life uh, or how large, uh, but they didn't come up with a, a new way of uh, ritualistic uh, piety uh, or they didn't also uh, acclaim or <clears throat> came into a uh, clash uh, at the epistemological uh, level, which is Irfan came uh, increasingly uh, a way of thinking uh, or adopted as uh, a new way of truth seeking among the uh, Sufis, but especially in areas such as India, uh, right, where Muslims entered, but 99% of population is still non-Muslims. Anatolia, uh, Seljuks uh, came, but the majority of uh, people are non-Muslims. Sub-Saharan uh, Sub Africa, uh, especially where Berbers uh, lived. Uh, north Africa was invaded uh, a long time ago, uh, but mostly in the north, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa was a gradual uh, place to uh, convert to Islam, and it was a frontier uh, line. Or uh, Indo-Malaysia, um, that region later on. So all these places uh, where the local populations uh, were just being exposed uh, to Islam, uh, the Sufis uh, became primary figures of spreading Islam. In fact, if you look at the history of uh, Sufism, uh, almost all of them, including the Balkans, <laughs> Uh, they were saintly figures uh, who were credited uh, to bring Islam uh, into that uh, region as charismatic uh, leaders. Uh, their knowledge is not uh, so much important, uh, but they had such charismatic following uh, from local uh, populations, and they were often credited um, uh, with that because they were more accommodative of local differences. Now, by 11th century, Islamic law is very much uh, set. Uh, the books are uh, very, um, uh, how to standardized, uh, both furu and uh, usul books, uh, not much wiggle room uh, there. And ulama's primary function is to implement Islam in a standardized way, wherever. That's the mission, uh, right? The, the alim uh, doesn't take uh, local differences uh, much. Uh, so a prayer, for example, or fasting should be done in the same way, whether it is Spain or it's India. Uh, that's what alim does and that's his mission, uh, right? But Sufi are much more lenient, uh, much more uh, accommodative uh, because they mostly emerge in societies who have no idea uh, about Islam yet. I'll give you an example. We have interlinear uh, Quran uh, translations uh, in Anatolia and in many areas <clears throat> as well. I've seen in uh, such uh, Qurans in, in Yemen uh, libraries, for example, in maybe you might know uh, better in local languages around Indian Ocean. Uh, there are Masahif, uh, but they wrote uh, the translations uh, between the lines. Uh, not They didn't translate the Quran, which is a 20th century thing, uh, but they wrote equivalents uh, of Quranic terms uh, between the lines. And there were such many uh, Mus'hafs uh, in Anatolia as well, and from 13th, 14th century, right? And when you look at them, you are amazed because they translated every word. Next to Allah, they wrote Tanrı. So one might think, why did they translate Allah <laughs> to a Muslim audience? Uh, they might not know. Uh, they know because in Turkish, uh, God means Tanrı. Uh, they might not know Allah means Tanrı yet, at least not all of them. For, uh, for uh, Jannah, 
for Jahannam, uh, all these basic words were translated. So that means they had a very little understanding or knowledge of uh, Islam. Uh, yeah, so in that context, those charismatic spiritual uh, figures became very uh, popular. Uh, and they, had, they did not have a very strong connection uh, with the learned traditions uh, of Islam. Uh, and they mostly relied on their uh, spiritual uh, enlightenments, uh, discoveries, uh, et cetera. Uh, and they also claimed uh, that that's a major shift, uh, of course, along with <clears throat> Suhravardi uh, and perhaps Ibn Sina could be included in that uh, mix, which uh, became sophisticated with uh, Ibn Arabi uh, and Rumi, et cetera. Uh, they, um, a group of such Sufis are uh, now claiming uh, that truth uh, can be reached multiple ways. Uh, whereas ulama said from the very beginning, it is conveyed language, right? Uh, Islam was uh, completed, complete at the time of the uh, prophet. To the extent we discover and learn is what we implement. Uh, now that's the uh, struggle, uh, but the objective is to recreate uh, the knowledge at the time of the prophet in their uh, own times. But the, there is only one way: it is not uh, right, not an interpretation of uh, not for uh, ulama. But Sufi now, not all of them, uh, started to claim uh, that what is conveyed uh, through uh, since the uh, prophet could be achieved in the spiritual realms. Uh, how does it happen? It happens through uh, moral purification. Uh, they argue that as a human being, we have the capacity to be directly exposed uh, to the truth because how, Part of our nature, human nature, is directly linked uh, to the divine, uh, right? Through philosophers called akl uh, or the alam uh, malaku. And these uh, Sufi thought that if uh, they uh, purify themselves through uh, teskiyah uh, and struggle uh, and become worthy, uh, they could be exposed because their understanding of Nubuwa uh, is this. Nubuwa, uh, the Nebis, received knowledge without uh, any conveyed, any, without books uh, or ulema. So the way Nebis do, we can uh, do and be exposed uh, to that uh, knowledge. And that created, of course, a lot of controversy and many Sufi. Uh, uh, were branded as um, heretics, uh, some rebelled, uh, some executed. So Sufi has a very complicated um, history, but very gradually they also became um, part of the learned tradition as well without actually renouncing their claim. They still claim that they could be <laughs> exposed, but just as uh, some uh, philosophers such as Ghazali said in the case of uh, the conflict, possible conflict between reason and uh, revelation. Sufi, some of them also said that if there's a conflict uh, between a spiritual realization uh, and uh, wahi or nakil, nakil should be preferred because you could be erred, you could be mistaken, uh, you could be in ecstasy, you may not know. And a very good example of that is uh, Rumi. You know Rumi, not uh, all of the ruling. Uh, dervishes uh, from Konya. <clears throat> and do you know what Rumi did uh, as his uh, profession <clears throat> for a living? Do you know what was his job? He was a mudarris. <laughs> so during the day, <clears throat> he, was a, he was a paid <clears throat> mudarris in a madrasa. He was teaching fukh uh, and uh, tafsir. Uh, and in the uh, Tekke, in the Hanka and uh, Zavia, uh, he was doing Teskia. Uh, so for him, there is no conflict 
uh, between uh, spiritual exposition uh, to the truth uh, and what you see in the um, in the nakt. But as I said, uh, Sufi is a very uh, vast <clears throat> uh, category and many controversial uh, Sufis. Uh, what Sufi has uh, impact in the Islamic civilization uh, was that they created a whole new institution. Uh, right, so if you were to enter uh, a Muslim community, uh, or if you're, let's say, Ibn Battuta, uh, right, there are certain uh, markers of Muslim communities uh, or cities, uh, right? One would be, of course, mosques. Uh, when you go, you see a mosque. Uh, and then from 11th century onwards, you see, uh, no, 10th century onwards, you see the rise of madrasas. Uh, right, so almost every city you go, uh, there is a madrasa. Uh, right, from 12th century onwards, now you have zavias uh, or ribats uh, or tekkas in Turkish uh, context or hankas. Uh, so, very quickly from 12th century onwards, uh, as many as madrasas uh, were built across the uh, entire Muslim world, uh, those spiritual centers of. Uh, learning and uh, piety. They attracted initially uh, different sections of uh, society, uh, but then um, they infused uh, in from 13th century onwards, interestingly, uh, increasing number of uh, ulema uh, also become Sufi or vice versa. Uh, and sure. Yeah, very good question. Yes. <laughs> yes, there are monasteries, and some of those monasteries actually were built within uh, the Muslim ruled places uh, as well. Uh, but there are major differences too. I mean, the rise of uh, Christian uh, asceticism uh, or spirituality or monastic life actually precedes uh, Islam. Uh, so, um, and then uh, in the 11th, I think it's 12th century uh, when um, the two major uh, spiritual, no, uh, say it. Uh, Franciscans and Dominicans uh, started to um, spread in Europe. Uh, until then, there were mostly uh, those ascetic uh, Christians, uh, but even Franciscans and uh, Jesuits, basically, uh, the Dominicans were quite different from uh, Sufia because Sufia, uh, first of all, has uh, this claim on. Uh, truth, uh, which was based on uh, Irfan, uh, finding out the truth by self-realization. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, they all establish lineages uh, to the prophet, just like the ulema does. Uh, you know, we talked about ijazas uh, of ulemas, uh, right? All these ijazas are actually going to the Sahaba. Uh, whether fictitious or not, that's uh, how they uh, think of themselves. And Sufia also, all tariqas in Islamic world uh, go back to either Abu Bakr or Ali, uh, right? When these two are considered as the founders of spiritual uh, training. And it's also required uh, in Sufism that you have to have uh, that uh, authorization. Uh, you need to be authorized by your sheikh uh, and your sheikh should be linked all the way to Ali uh, or Abu Bakr Rumi, for example, was linked to um, Ali. So Mevlevis were uh, an Ali uh, lineage. Um, and thirdly, uh, those, um, and that's, I think, the most important difference. Um, initially, those uh, Zavias and Hankas uh, and Ribats were 
attracting people uh, who were outcasts, uh, right? So here there is city life uh, with all these material benefits uh, and excitement and careers, and you give up all those uh, and you go seek a spiritual uh, life. Right? It's sort of an escapism uh, from the real life. You totally devote yourself uh, to, to the divine uh, and day and night, day and night uh, you, you do two things uh, to purify uh, your animal soul, uh, let's say. Uh, but from the 12th century onwards, uh, Sufism became more and more engaged uh, with social, political, and economic uh, life. Uh, they became very much part and parcel of it. Uh, as I said, ulema uh, became connected uh, to the Sufia, uh, and they actually incorporated uh, the very curriculum they use in madrasas uh, to the uh, tekkes as well. They started to uh, instruct um, kalam books uh, and fiqh books uh, in uh, tekkes. Uh, secondly, um, they uh, got engaged uh, in economic life, they engaged in trade, uh, in commerce, uh, in craftsmanship. So Islamic Sufism was not escapism uh, from uh, social and uh, economic life, very much into it. And the ideal became uh, such that um, your spiritual uh, status uh, should not be visible. You should not pose uh, as a spiritual uh, person. Um, you should be uh, a regular uh, person um, and you should only have uh, that status um, and exposition uh, to the light of uh, divine in your uh, spirituality. So from outside, I should see only uh, a trader, uh, a craftsman, uh, a soldier, uh, a bureaucrat, uh, but you should be otherwise because that's what Sufi ethics uh, imply if you pose as a uh, Sufi, uh, that means you are getting some credit uh, for being a Sufi. People praise you, uh, and that actually compromises uh, your uh, spiritual uh, ascension. So, in that regard, um, Sufism and Sufi tariqas became very important uh, instruments uh, in society uh, across the uh, Muslim world. Uh, they became indispensable uh, for, I will give you an example of that, <clears throat> for the function of uh, economy, production, even in the agricultural uh, side, because Sufism spread into <clears throat> countryside too. Unlike ulema, ulema was almost exclusively an urban uh, phenomenon. So scholars would only be in cities, uh, right? But Sufia would be in mountains, uh, in the valleys of uh, Montenegro, Macedonia, you can find them uh, in very exotic uh, places and they have their own land uh, to cultivate. And they started to uh, also serve a very important function uh, in society, uh, such as operating uh, a whole range of services uh, for the benefit of uh, people. So they were not dependent uh, on other people's donations. Uh, in fact, they started to provide uh, for other people. Those dervishes were supposed to work in the land uh, or in their workshops, uh, earn money, and uh, provide uh, for the needy and the sick. Uh, and at least that's the <clears throat> um, ideal, uh, right? Um, and the third um, group was kutab, uh, the scribes uh, or the learned. Uh, people. Uh, and these were also enabled uh, by what we point in the beginning, the language, uh, right? The first initially it was the Arabic uh, language. And then even when Turkish and uh, Persian uh, became the uh, primary languages of Eastern and Northern parts of the uh, Muslim world, those uh, scribes uh, found themselves part of a larger um, entity. Uh, they were not just working uh, bureaucrats for their individual bureaucracies in Damascus uh, or Tabriz or uh, elsewhere. They were equipped with such skills uh, and knowledge that they can work anywhere. Uh, 
Uh, and we have so many examples uh, of that. You, know, you start your career in Baghdad, uh, and then you become chief of chancellor in uh, Samarkand, uh, or uh, vice versa, uh, because they know uh, the uh, record keeping uh, conventions, uh, history writing conventions, uh, writing communications uh, between dynasties uh, and others, um, image making, uh, such as inscription writings uh, for the sultans and uh, rulers, etc. They all uh, constituted uh, the broader tradition of uh, adab, uh, and they were the primary uh, representatives of that <clears throat> adab uh, tradition. Uh, as we see uh, in the uh, very popular genre of uh, mirrors for princes, princes uh, such as Siaset Names, uh, the books on uh, government. And that, though, if you look at those books, <clears throat> they're not only about the technical matters of uh, how to govern uh, a state <clears throat> or a country, uh, they were mostly about the principles of good rulership. Uh, or good governance uh, about justice, um, about uh, about uh, creating wealth uh, for the uh, society, uh, etc. And they all rely on uh, the broader uh, repository of uh, Islamic plus uh, the traditions came into uh, the Islamic context uh, through the. Uh, intermediacy of uh, Arabic. I'll just give you one uh, example. Uh, that's Kalila Dimna. Uh, you might all uh, heard of it, uh, right? It is an ancient Indian uh, text, uh, and we don't have the Sanskrit original uh, of that. Uh, we don't even have the Persian original of that. But Ibn Mukaffa translated the work, uh, or reworked uh, maybe uh, the text, uh, in Arabic, but he used the uh, Pahlavi, uh, the Persian version uh, of it, and it became a completely uh, domesticated, uh, local, internalized text. Nobody thought of uh, as a as a book from some other people. It was totally owned. Uh, it became one of the masterpieces of uh, Arabic literature, uh, right? And what's there? Wisdom. Uh, of course, uh, how to rule uh, a government efficiently uh, and justly. Uh, and those stories uh, became uh, widely circulating uh, in a wide range of books written on uh, government. Uh, and also as, as local stories uh, in the, among in the tongues of uh, local people. So that very uh, piece of literature uh, written in a completely different uh, context uh, for a different audience uh, became one of the canonical texts uh, in the uh, Arabic slash Muslim uh, context. Later on, it was translated into Persian many, many times uh, into Turkish and all other uh, languages which Muslims uh, speak, including uh, European languages, of course, Latin language, uh, French, um, etc. cetera. Um, so let's, yeah, that um, the Kutab. Um, now we have examples who work in multiple courts, uh, but still always trying to cultivate uh, the same kind of uh, just rulership. Uh, so it's not that uh, they uh, completely after their uh, careers in a given uh, court, uh, but using their these common uh, set of uh, skills everywhere they go, uh, whether they work uh, for the Timurids later on or the uh, Ottomans, what they write and do uh, is same set of uh, teachings, which were seasoned and refined uh, in that tradition of adab uh, since the rise of uh, Islam and translation of uh, books from um, other languages. Now, uh, we talked about um, Ulema Sufiye uh, Kuttab, and one more institution just to um, highlight, uh, again, because of its uh, significance, is uh, the very courts 
the sultans, uh, the governors' uh, courts, because um, when you go to pre-modern uh, times, there were not many autonomous institutions uh, that as an intellectual man of culture, you can operate, uh, right? They were very, very limited. One was madrasa, if you're a learned man, uh, and regardless of your learning interests, you could actually use madrasa as uh, that kind of a setting. There is wide separate understanding of madrasas in uh, current literature as sort of they were devoted entirely to religious sciences, which was true uh, by and large, but that didn't, that didn't uh, limit a given scholar's uh, intellectual activity. So a madrasa is a religious uh, institution uh, to teach kalam and hadith and uh, fuqh, but uh, you could be a philosopher, uh, right? Or you could be a Sufi teaching those uh, sciences. And you can teach other things. There is a curriculum that needs to be taught to students for their graduation. But in addition to that, uh, based on student interest, uh, you can study with students a uh, wide range of uh, sciences. We have so many examples uh, of that. Uh, that um, students studying astronomy, um, chemistry, uh, mathematics, uh, even engineering uh, with professors in madrasas, not part of the curriculum, uh, but based on the interests of students and um, professors. <laughs> uh, yes, and similarly, uh, Zavias and Sufi institutions also attracted uh, people of uh, different um, uh, different interests uh, in life. Uh, now that we uh, have to include arts uh, and music uh, into the broader spectrum of Islamic uh, civilization, uh, what was the main institution of uh, music, uh, for example. It was Zavias, uh, right? Because it was largely allowed. In Madrasa, no, <laughs> because a jurist would say it's haram. Uh, and very limited cases, you can uh, practice it in weddings, uh, with limited instruments, uh, that's allowed. But in Sufi uh, institutions were more uh, accommodated uh, for such manifestations. Uh, of human interest, and especially uh, certain Sufi um, tariqahs such as Chishtiya uh, in uh, India uh, or Mevleviya uh, in Ottoman uh, Empire through Balkans and uh, other parts, they became repositories uh, of uh, music, uh, spiritual, uh, pietistic uh, music, not entertainment music. Uh, of course, but once uh, you are trained uh, in music, you are a musician. Uh, you play instruments, uh, you can sing uh, songs uh, or hymns, uh, etc. So, uh, especially in the Ottoman uh, case, uh, those tarikas uh, became like uh, conservatories uh, for musical uh, education. Uh, and just like that, uh, the courts, uh, the sultans and governors' uh, courts, functioned uh, to accommodate uh, people whose profession do not support them. Uh, if you're a poet, uh, right? If you're a learned man, if you're an artist, uh, then there is no art market uh, at the time. There is no market for uh, music, uh, right? If you're a painter or calligrapher, what do you do? Uh, you have to be supported uh, by some sort of uh, institution. And here we have courts, uh, those local governors uh, and the caliph and other uh, sultans, they all felt obliged uh, to support this men of uh, art uh, and uh, learning, first for their own benefit, of course. I mean, who doesn't want to be a friend with musicians and <laughs> Uh, painters and uh, poets, right? Uh, because that's uh, that what makes life more uh, interesting. Uh, they also write poetry, 
uh, for the sultans, they paint, uh, they illustrate their books, uh, they inscribe uh, their uh, walls as uh, calligraphers, uh, they write nice books uh, in calligraphy, uh, etc. So it's a symbiotic relationship uh, and the wide range of uh, artists uh, and uh, poets and men of literature were supported uh, by that. So those courts function as if they are schools uh, of thought uh, and artistic um, activity. Now let's turn to uh, more institutions. We have so many more, but I will not, of course, talk all of them. Um, what about the society at large? Uh, and so far, we mostly talked about the elite, uh, right? The sultans, uh, the jurists, the Sufis, uh, et cetera. Uh, but there are people who produce things, the people who engage in uh, commerce. Uh, and one very important institution uh, that gradually uh, took form from late Abbasid period onward was guilds, uh, right? Professional guilds, uh, which include craftsmen, uh, and merchants, uh, and for the purpose of um, disciplining and regulating uh, and imposing uh, morality on the cycle of production uh, and exchange, uh, right? And they also became quickly um, integrated uh, with the broader traditions of the uh, society, most importantly, Sufism, uh, right? Now, um, here I have to uh, make a parenthesis uh, that by the more we go uh, into the uh, medieval and late medieval period, the more we see the confluence of uh, various intellectual and cultural traditions, uh, right? A good example would be Ibn Miskawe's um, ethics. Uh, right, Ibn Miskawe right, wrote the most popular uh, book on akhlaq uh, in the Islamic tradition. Uh, he was a philosopher, uh, but those akhlaq uh, uh, norms uh, that he outlined in the book uh, adopted uh, by a wide range of uh, people in the Muslim uh, community, uh, including Sufis and the uh, ulama uh, and courtly people uh, like Kuttab. Now, apart, if you look at uh, the uh, ethical structure uh, of a professional guild, you can see that too. Uh, so all these traditions are now uh, merging. And how these uh, guilds uh, took form um, in, uh, in cities uh, was to enforce the set of uh, morality which Sufis Impose within the zawiya and ulama within the legal uh, sphere, they started to self-impose uh, that morality uh, among themselves because Sufia and uh, ulama have uh, only so much reach. Uh, you cannot control um, everything, right? And those guilds uh, became moral institutions uh, at the same time. Uh, and they were uh, hierarchized. Uh, they would, every guild would have its own head, uh, the guild master. Uh, so just like uh, the ijaza uh, in the madrasa or the zawiya, in the guilds too, you needed to have an ijaza, not only for your skills, uh, but also for your uh, morality. Uh, let's say you are a tailor, uh, right? There's a tailor's guild in the uh, city. So you learned how to stitch uh, things, but not, you cannot easily get an ijaza. You also have to be a righteous person, uh, an upright person. Uh, if you are swindling others, uh, if your transactions are not good, if you are lying, uh, if you are using bad material, uh, in city teaching uh, and charging more money for that. No, you cannot get that uh, ijaz, at least that's the <clears throat> um, ideal. So the guilds became schools uh, of moral and 
professional education. Uh, you get educated, you get licensed, you get your license, and then you practice. And also both uh, production and exchange are also regulated. Uh, you cannot sell it at any price. You can't, uh, the prices are set, uh, right? Also, you have to produce it at a set quality. You cannot produce something low quality and then just bring it into the uh, market. All right. So those guilds started to be uh, self-regulating institutions uh, to make sure uh, that the production and exchange cycle uh, is conducted based on uh, both moral and professional uh, standards. And outside the guilds, who ensures that things uh, are good? I'll show a picture of that um, in the slides. If you, uh, it's just up. That, that's what I'm. You mean Achis? Not he's the price system. Yeah, it's price control. Yeah, I mean, we can talk about in the context of uh, Muhtasib. Muhtasib uh, is a very interesting uh, institution. Uh, of course, it's an economic um, institution about the marketplace, but also it has cultural and um, economic and moral uh, repercussions. And Muht also, interestingly, Muhtasib, um, some historians argue uh, that's a very ancient institution. Uh, that actually presides uh, the coming of uh, Islam. They're basically market inspectors, uh, right? They make sure uh, that transactions in the marketplace are first uh, moral, uh, based not uh, infringe the established moral values in society, uh, and all the goods uh, are what they are claimed to be by their sellers, uh, right? And Muhtasibs had to be uh, trained uh, in jurisprudence. So they are basically scholars, uh, but they had certain um, extrajudicial <laughs> powers. Uh, in Qadi, uh, in the court, passes a judgment. That's it. A Qadi cannot execute a penalty, all right? J Qadi says you are guilty, and then the local governor applies the uh, sentence. Uh, Qadis do not have executive power. But Muhtasibs had. Muhtasib uh, in the marketplace, if they catches you, <laughs> you are doing some wrongdoing, he can beat you up uh, in the marketplace. Uh, if he sees something against morality uh, in the marketplace, for example, a slave is mistreated uh, by the owner, he can punish uh, that owner in the market. Uh, place. So he has that wide range of uh, powers, uh, which I will uh, show. So Muhtasibs are very critical uh, for the smooth functioning of marketplace as both an economic and social uh, space. Okay, lastly, I'll, uh, I don't think we have much time left. I'll talk about um, the public space um, in terms of um, how it functioned uh, historically and uh, coming to the modern uh, times. Now we have uh, in medieval times, those institutions or proto institutions uh, in which certain activities could be done. Uh, but beyond those uh, confines, uh, we cannot really speak of a broader public space uh, in which different kinds of people or activities come together, uh, right? So imagine uh, any city, uh, let's take um, Baghdad, uh, right in the 10th uh, century. You could go to Madrasa, but how many of you, if you are not related to Madrasa, you have no business there. You only see the building, right? Uh, if there is a guilt later, uh, like that. Uh, if you're a professional worker or craftsman, yeah, you go to uh, your atelier, uh, your workshop, uh, and you hang out uh, with your own kin. 
uh, right? If you are Muslim, you go to mosque. And you only see Muslims. Uh, if you're a Christian, you go to uh, church. So people of different walks of life and interests do not necessarily cross paths, right? Um, you see each other maybe in the marketplace. If you know, you say, hello, uh, how are you? That's it. Uh, there is no space you can sit and talk and do things. Uh, that's uh, so public space also architecturally uh, was quite limited uh, at the time. That's why um, places of worship uh, would have uh, very large courtyards. Yeah. So after the prayer in church or uh, mosque, people hang out uh, in those places for all sorts of uh, things. But again, in a given uh, <clears throat> place of worship, only uh, invites and accommodates uh, people of the same faith, uh, not from um, others. Uh, what if, for example, you have a Christian friend? Where do you go uh, to talk? Not many places, uh, right? So um, there is occasions uh, of intermingling. Uh, and we have a very rich history uh, of that, uh, such as uh, sports, the competitions city-wise, uh, there are many examples of it, processions of certain important, um, uh, culturally or religiously important uh, dates. Mevlid, for example, became very important uh, in the Seljuk times and uh, onwards, uh, which would be cherished uh, like a festival, uh, Muslims or non-Muslims, doesn't, uh, much uh, matter. Uh, certain uh, days, uh, such as the uh, spring, the beginning of the uh, spring day, which would be celebrated by uh, the entire uh, But These were, again, very, very uh, limited. Now, in the 16th century, something happened that basically changed world history uh, entirely, uh, right? And that's the rise of uh, coffee houses, uh, right? Now, coffee, as we know it, was first probably uh, discovered by Somalians or Eritreans somewhere in East Africa, uh, along with the Yemenites. Yeah, uh, so the entire world, including Starbucks, should pay royalty to Yemen, people in Yemen, I think, uh, because otherwise there is no coffee uh, at all. So they first discovered the beverage, but it became popular by Sufis. Sufis discovered the awakening properties uh, of coffee because they spend long hours chanting um, and uh, doing zikr uh, in their zawiyas. It became very popular beverage among the uh, Sufis in uh, Yemen. Then two um, brave entrepreneurs <laughs> Uh, let's say, uh, started to open uh, coffee houses in Cairo. Uh, because Cairo and Yemen, basically same cultural uh, orbit. Um, and then seeing that it works uh, in Cairo, uh, some other entrepreneurs started to uh, open them in Istanbul. Uh, and then from that time onwards, from middle of the 16th century onwards, uh, it became it, it spread more than today's Starbucks, uh, right? By the end of the century, there was uh, probably some, uh, hundreds of coffee houses uh, in Istanbul. Now, coffee house um, transformed uh, the functioning of society in very subtle and deep uh, ways. First, uh, it created a space uh, which accommodates and invites anybody. Uh, right, uh, because it's not a religious uh, space and it's not uh, a professional uh, space that require uh, only a group of uh, people. So anybody could go there just for the sake of drinking uh, coffee. Uh, and what do you do while drinking coffee? You talk. Uh, so now you have the opportunity to talk to people of different faith, uh, different professions, different walks of uh, life. Uh, and that created uh, public discourse for the first time. Now, again, just a little back, 
uh, there, your worldview, uh, not in the ideological sense, your view of the world, let's say, the broader world, would be cultivated by bits and pieces of stories that you hear from here and there. Your grandma tells a story about jinns in Indian Ocean. Okay, you, you have a now sense of Indian Ocean uh, and their dragons, uh, whatever, and then Calf Mountain somewhere. Your view of was really based on uh, those very disconnected stories that you hear from here and there. And if you know someone sailing, you might hear about other people, uh, about kuffar, unbelievers, uh, elsewhere. Uh, if you travel, and people don't travel much uh, at the time. If you travel, know someone who travels, he might tell you uh, city life in the other uh, cities, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, otherwise you don't read books. Uh, there are no books available. Uh, there are. Uh, but uh, in madrasas, uh, in the governors or sultans' uh, courts, uh, and in a very limited number of libraries. Uh, but rate of literacy was so, so low. And the act of uh, reading books uh, is not as we do now. Uh, then, uh, at that time, uh, there is no such thing, basically, as reading books. Literary works were mostly read as performances, uh, right? Nobody takes Kelly Dimna with a coffee uh, and reads it. Someone who knows how to read it comes to a majlis, I read it with acting, uh, and then you enjoy it. That's how literature uh, was enjoyed. Uh, as for science books or fukuh books, they cannot be read without a master. Uh, there's a jurist that dictates you uh, how to uh, read. And it takes months to finish uh, one book, word by word, explaining every um, interesting subtlety uh, about that. <clears throat> but now, uh, once you start freely engaging conversations in uh, coffee houses, all of a sudden, uh, it's news flood. I mean, for me, that's the difference between pre-internet age and the internet age. Now, when I first started my doctoral study, I went away from um, Turkey. I would go to the library uh, once in a month uh, and bring together newspapers and get the news uh, from Turkey. Otherwise, none, uh, right? I mean, for one month, you have no idea uh, what was going on uh, in Turkey. But with the rise of internet, now every second we know what's going on everywhere else, uh, right? I think the difference is somewhat like, somewhat like that. Before coffee houses, uh, they're very, those bits and pieces of knowledge, now flood of knowledge. Uh, you hear things from everywhere. For example, there might be soldiers coming to the uh, coffee house talking about wars that they've been to, they're sailors. Uh, they are talking about sea battles or those exotic uh, places. There might be merchants uh, who have been to uh, Persia, India, China, telling stories, uh, what they have seen. There could be intellectuals uh, talking about things they read uh, in the book. There are poets reciting poetry uh, there. Uh, there may be people doing gossip, uh, what's going on in the neighborhood. <laughs> Uh, who is seeing who. Uh, so all of a sudden, the state, the cities, uh, and the world became smaller. Uh, you, you just know much more uh, about it. Um, and that's how a sort of a public discourse uh, and consciousness uh, developed. So now you start to think about broader things. Uh, just like, for example, now, uh, if the economy is going down, you are uh, feels anxious, uh, right? And so you follow inflation. So you, we all think about these broader questions, uh, right? Now. Then, question, small questions uh, that you that might have occupied you becoming bigger and bigger uh, because you know uh, disruptions uh, 
um, in the state. You have a better sense of the state, what is uh, where. Um, and then certain events or news now catches the attention of people, uh, right? For example, a good example of it, um, one Ottoman Sultan, uh, when he succeeded, uh, ordered the execution of all his brothers uh, to ensure uh, his um, authority. And then that quickly circulated all of Istanbul instantly. Uh, and that Sultan became one of the most unpopular uh, Sultans, uh, which was later on followed by some uh, rebellions uh, in the country. Now, going fast forward, uh, those coffee houses became the hotbeds uh, of every revolutionary activity anywhere. I mean, you cannot think of French Revolution uh, or 1848 revolutions or even <clears throat> Bolshevik Revolution without uh, coffee houses uh, because these were the places where uh, people came together, disseminated uh, news, um, got ideologized or spread their ideologies. Um, Etc. So uh, these are the, some of just highlights of uh, Islamic, uh, the institutional uh, basis of uh, Islamic civilization. Now, uh, in conclusion, uh, we could say uh, before we move to uh, pictures uh, that Islamic civilization, um, of course, became shaped uh, by the faith tradition. Uh, by Islam itself. In the meantime, we can also think of Islam as shaped by Islamic civilization in the sense uh, that, for example, if today we are talking about a mosque uh, as a representative example of Islamic civilization or Islam, as we cannot think of Islam without a mosque, and that very mosque architecture uh, has developed over centuries different from each other uh, because of these civilizational uh, interactions. Uh, Islamic art uh, became part and parcel of um, Islam as uh, Ustaz talked about uh, calligraphy, uh, right? So at the time when Quran uh, was revealed, there was no calligraphy. There was only like Tijazi uh, script uh, perhaps, but then we have this exquisite art of uh, calligraphy, which is a production of uh, Islamic uh, civilization or sciences, uh, even usul fuqh, there was no fuqh or usul uh, at the time Islam was uh, born. These were all later uh, developments. So it is uh, a symbiotic uh, relationship. In general, we could say um, about Islamic civilization that it is flexible. Uh, so we cannot just assume that once there was uh, this Islamic civilization uh, and then it died. Uh, no, it is constantly changing, flexible, adapting uh, civilization. It is cosmopolitan in the sense uh, that it cultivated in, this, in the community an identity that supersedes uh, their local identities. Uh, and having a more universal um, attachments uh, to, to values. And it's interactive. Uh, it, has, um, it has worldliness uh, in it. Uh, it's not against uh, the, uh, the, the building and refinement of uh, the world around you. Uh, on the contrary, uh, it's very much attached uh, to the material world uh, around you. It is diverse. Uh, it is uh, pluralistic uh, in the sense that it involves or it accommodates a wide range of uh, uh, different elements uh, in its without necessarily transforming them. They just uh, exist within the broader framework of uh, Islamic civilization. Now, if you could show those pictures, uh, they're just fun pictures from uh, Ottoman social and cultural life. Uh, yeah, we can. Can I move them with myself? This works. No. I 
It's okay. Thank you. Oh, so what is this? No, I'm asking the audience. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is a madrasa. Uh, the scholar is going into a madrasa. Next, please. How about this? Yeah, there are probably merchants. Uh, next, please. What is this? This is souk. Yeah, and you see it's a very uh, active, uh, there are sword makers, archers, um, etc. interact, the books uh, for sale. Next, please. And this is actually, I forgot, uh, well, we didn't have time to talk about Vox. So this is a fountain. <clears throat> and actually, uh, perhaps the most important cultural and social foundation uh, in Islamic civilization is uh, waqfs, uh, right? So the importance of waqfs, uh, the pious foundations, is that they are autonomous, right? And they are created for perpetuity. So a philanthropist endows uh, a tangible asset not intangible as for example, you cannot endow money. Um, it became an issue later on, but in general, uh, this is a fountain uh, which is founded by a waqfs. All fountains uh, in Muslim countries, all madrasas, all of the zawiyas, uh, all bridges, hospitals, uh, public kitchens, um, you name it, uh, so animal houses. So Waqf became um, a, an area uh, in which society could be sustained uh, through philanthropy. Um, and uh, it's because of uh, its assets cannot um, diminish in life, therefore perpetuity. They have their either land uh, or commercial estates which continuously uh, support the uh, work. They also have their own management, uh, independent. They come up with a chart, charter uh, of the uh, work they had. Uh, that charter uh, also sanctioned at the court of the Qadi. So it is sanctioned by the Sharia. So even the rulers cannot take it back. Uh, there's one uh, widespread and very notorious uh, example of it. Uh, Mehmed II, uh, the conqueror of uh, Constantinople, <laughs> uh, he wasn't in good relations uh, with especially Sufia. Uh, and he was a, he, he wanted to centralize uh, the empire and check that much of the land uh, in the country was in the waqf form. So he confiscated them. Uh, but after a long struggle, um, his son, Bayez II, had to give it all back uh, to um, initial founders of uh, Vak. So this is one of those uh, fountains which we have tens of thousands of uh, them in the Muslim world. So this is uh, an occasion for public uh, sports uh, event. As you can see, next please. This is another sports event, wrestling, uh, obviously. Next please. So this is, this looks like a um, caravan sarai. Uh, where merchants resting their um, animals. Next, please. This is a festival in the uh, city. Next, please. This is again uh, a festival. Uh, it could also be a telling by their hats, uh, a janissary um, barracks uh, that cooking, uh, or it could even be a public kitchen. Next, please. Uh, this is another uh, competition. Uh, used to be in Istanbul, there were hundreds of these um, targets uh, erected out of competition. They would try to shoot uh, those uh, targets and every record would be inscribed <clears throat> on those. Now, not many left. This is a, a war scene. It's, next, please. This is Moezin. <laughs> Next, please. Uh, this is the Sultan crossing the Bosporus Bridge. Next, please. The ladies, 
uh, walking. Next, please. This is probably uh, a high-ranking uh, alim, Sheikhul Islam, perhaps, uh, or a chief judge, accompanied by his guards. Next, please. This is a model of the mosque, not the, not the mosque itself. Uh, in processions, uh, in <clears throat> processions became so routine uh, and extravagant uh, in the 16th century uh, that every guild would take part. Uh, for example, this architect's guild would make models of uh, mosque, the sword makers guild make model uh, swords, etc. And there will be a huge uh, procession for fun. Next, please. Sure. Uh -huh. There you go. They still touch until today. They don't use speakers, no speakers, uh, no microphone, no. Uh, no. They for five times they go out. Right, original way. Oh. <laughs> Do they go up? Yeah. Oh, yeah. To the minaret. Uh, okay. Next, please. Um, yeah, these uh, dervishes, as you can see, this is uh, a barber practicing. And this is again a, from a festival, having fun. Um, this is, yeah, what's happening here? Who? Who is the guy who is beating? This guy is punished, obviously. Yeah. This is Muhtasib. <laughs> so he caught someone who was infringing. Yeah, and he's being punished there. As I said, Muhtasib's had this authority. Qadi cannot do it. Qadi has to go through the book and decide the judgment, but Mutasib can punish on the spot. So it's the most fearful person in Muslim cities. Next, please. This is, huh. This is probably um, a Zavia, and this is a Sheikh. Uh, we can tell it from these animal parts because they usually sit. Um, on them, and this is probably a parent uh, bringing his, telling by the size, uh, the children initiated into the tekke, and these are other uh, dervishes. Next, please. We can pass this one to the royal scene. Uh, another saintly or high-ranking ulema figure. It's, next, please. These are those whirling dervishes from the Mevlevi uh, order. Next, please. This is a mosque scene. This is another, probably, Sheikh Islam. Next, please. As ladies are, most probably, uh, ladies are going to Hammam. Because as part of that waqf uh, structure, there are so many public baths in Ottoman cities and elsewhere in Egypt, uh, Iraq as well. Uh, and certain days uh, of the week were exclusively allocated uh, to women and women would often go with their children uh, to the hammams. And these are black slaves, uh, also um, high ranking officers in Ottoman <clears throat> administration. So what's going on here? It's circumcision. Uh, so this poor kid having circumcised, and this is the next scene, he is recovering. And this is when smoking arrived uh, in late 16th century. You know, smoking arrived from the <clears throat> Americas. It became very controversial, but then slowly got uh, adopted and it was paired with coffee, uh, of course, as, is, as in today. But then it was more stylish. 
compared to today. Next, please. This is another sports event. This is another entertainment. This yeah, gentleman uh, in the countryside enjoying smoking. Uh, another gentleman. This is, I think, the circumcised kids place. These are uh, dervishes, again. Uh, in Sufism, there's a whole range of uh, spectrum. There are many different proclivities. Uh, there are um, one type of dervishes called kalenderi uh, dervishes uh, who renounced every material benefit uh, in life. They would dress minimally. They would uh, not work. They would say, a risk Allah. <laughs> Um, and uh, they, they might have their musical instruments, uh, their reading books, uh, obviously. Next, please. Is the last one? Oh, we have a few more. Yeah, this is uh, a modernist and the kid. Another one of your, probably this is from the Balkans. Next, please. Uh, another entertainment scene. Uh, this is a sermon uh, from the pulpit in the mosque. This is uh, a caravan sarai. Uh, you can see these are Europeans uh, lodging uh, in this place. This is uh, someone just deceased. And this is this is probably Sheikh Ul Islam. Uh, he's receiving a uh, delegation from Europe to say by their dress. And then this is also a Sheikh Al Islam. Um, another European delegation is um, arriving. This is, uh, see, professors had long sticks by then. You should be thankful. You don't have now. <laughs> Next, please. The end of it? Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, they, they look similar. I mean, the question is about um, Turkish historical TV series. Um, don't watch them as documentaries. They are all fiction. Um, the outfits, uh, the characters are mostly uh, factual, uh, but the events, the conversations, almost 95% is fiction, has uh, nothing to do with the actual history itself. But well, enjoy them. It's just fiction. <laughs> yes. First of all, I will thank you for having a great together and for the informative lecture and the very rich topic. Thank you very much. I just have a commentary and a I wish you can uh, give your feedback on it. It's about the uh, naming uh, Islamic civilization as a kid, Islamic civilization. For me, the whole idea and concept that civilization is indeed a common outcome based on cumulative uh, effort and the cooperation between Earth and planet. Things that our Western educators have so far faced in. Therefore, they effectively limited our uh, resources and techniques, mainly the paper and basket, for example, 
the Persian alphabetical, and so on. A naval demand, uh, early report, but relied on them, but there was not uh, a heavy reliance on, on those uh, resources. Thus, they translate their work to reshape the science based on evidence. They, in fact, could uh, free their minds from following blindly other findings. This is like uh, this is what history students have. They had that critical thinking that led them to question everything before they embrace a sort of position for it. This was before some ideology. And uh, accordingly, the century views the civilization not only by providing tangible and physical intentions, but also by making things in a unique way. What I mean by unique way. Putting ethics at first place. So, attributing the Islamic aim, Islamic civilization, this is my personal view, is totally, it is totally legal because of, the, because of the unique input Muslims had on the global civilization. Also, in my eyes, also, there is another factor that would justify this aim, the historical factor. So when we say Islamic civilization, we refer to Islamic era, especially the Azadi era. So it is refer to history that we choose the name of Islamic civilization. Finally, as we mentioned, so we said that non-Muslims who were major components of Islamic civilization were definitely offered a supportive environment to work uh, within, and those were open to them to emerge why we can't reduce effectively in silence, along with their Muslim beliefs. Why in dark ages, as we all know, in France, scientists, thinkers were executed, uh, their scientific attempts were also denied, and in many times subject to legal sanctions. Uh, this is my, no, let's say, justification of naming Islamic Civilization as it is now, some civilization, which uh, you can come on to me. For sure, as an academic, as all we have in academia, so we try to uh, observe all of the uh, existing opinions. And uh, I, would, I would just raise that point to say that there is uh, a justification that can be, um, can, can utilize this uh, naming, and it is not being biased to accept it. Well, oh, thank you for the <clears throat> comment and the question. If if I understood it um, correctly, uh, you find the concept of Islamic civilization justified and useful. That I agree on. Um, however, a few <clears throat> more things, if you could say uh, that I use it uh, with caution. Uh, not as an absolute category. For example, when we talk about Islamic law, we mean uh, that law entirely emanates from the scriptures. Quran, Hadith, Qiyas, you know it, Ijma. That's what is Islamic law. It's exclusively Islamic. However, when we speak about Islamic civilization, it includes a number of other elements which is linked uh, to Islam and Muslims, uh, but not entirely emanating from Islam itself. A good, just one example, uh, painting, right? The miniature painting. Now, miniature painting is exclusively belongs to Islamic civilization. It is an art form developed within the Islamic civilization. But can we say, it emanated from Islam? No, but they were Muslim painters, uh, right? That developed that um, art form and many ulema didn't like it. Some said it's okay, but some said it is um, haram. Uh, but we cannot say uh, it, is, um, it is just like Islamic law um, was produced based on uh, Islamic foundations. However, it took place within the Islamic context, developed mostly by uh, Muslim uh, painters. Therefore, we can consider it as part of Islamic uh, 
civilization. So that, that's the caution I have. That I agree. Thank you. Yes. Well, sometimes it's said Muslim civilization too. Uh, it was quite interesting in the book about Sufi and Sufi about uh, both of those. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it happened, uh, uh, they are under or uh, uh, about Sufis and their epistemology, and their Sufi epistemology. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, Sufis have tried and epistemology. Uh, but my question is Is there uh, a difference between Sufi Islam and Sufi Islam? Or is there any classification between Ulema and Sufi? Uh, and second, uh, secondly, uh, Sufis have like a right to go in the social construction, but why that affected? Criticism is a right for a state in a kind of society. And uh, there is Islamic uh, uh, for the various Shaliwa and Rujida Komori. And how could Sufi uh, construct a good society around them? Uh, I'm sure that it's Sufi, uh, uh, in India, uh, uh, there uh, were many Sufi uh, that spread Islam across. Yeah, that's uh, <clears throat> sure. Regarding to the reason, uh, also in the same context of the interaction of the set of status, the status of time, I would draw the attention of all of us. That Sufism, uh, as the doctor said, is not one thing, it's not merely really one thing. There are a lot of categories of the Sufis. Scholars at the historical level explain how this tendency has progressed from classical tendency and its logical approach uh, as a start to a religious based movement. Also, from Sufi, there were ulama who were working Then, uh, from giving up on Elm because the getting from Elm is national. Easily introduced by from the school, thinking that you actually read the book. And the critical review was addressed from great leaders of Sufia themselves. Name, for example, Mr. Abdul Hakim, who maybe the most famous figure in Cambridge University, who is great Sufi himself. Of course, there were multiple factors that made Sufi emerge in some regions and that affected in others. And to be developed, for example, uh, political factors or colonial differences would sometimes like Sufism lead the population in that spiritual form rather than having Sufaha at the front, at the forefront, because they would encourage people to fight the colon the, the, uh, colonialism via army jihad, not only uh, by jihad in less or chanting or vigor. That it is the that was not that was the case, for example, in uh, this is what literally happened during the French colonization of North Africa, but that was in the late 19th, the 19th, by in the 80s, one of the great Sufis who is in another part of time, the colonialism, also Muhammad al Fatih, who is a great figure of uh, Sufia, mashallah, he is in the church, he was Islam to Sufia and he was the father. Okay, so in that regard, 
and feed to Peru Tolipan is not being examined in my point of view from being uh, removed, evaluated in a different description of Quran and Sunnah. If it's been promoting humanization, we have to do rationalism here, maintain our heritage, the high standard, and we building our conception for perception based on evidences, either from nothing or logical reasoning or nothing. Okay, and my colleague, maybe or my one of us, maybe <laughs> is it a colleague? I'm not, not sure. So, uh, has maybe read the same, I mean, uh, concept, which is is there a difference between Sufia and Sufaha? When did Sufis live upon him as we hear? Or there are no, there are many tendencies, many categories, some were really Alama and some were not, some were less, um, less. Uh, have less consolidated and, and some have more consolidated and, and so on. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, mean, I take this um, as a comment uh, because there are two aspects to this question um, in response to both comments and questions. Uh, one question is what is Islamic civilization? which is the topic of this lecture. The other question is, what is Islam, right? And your comments and questions are more about what is Islam rather than what is Islamic civilization. Now, from civilizational perspective, uh, Sufism, uh, Tasawwuf, uh, is of course 100% uh, part of Islamic civilization. Uh, the Sufis, whether you like it or not, uh, they, Consider themselves uh, Muslims, uh, pious. Uh, they accepted uh, the scriptures, uh, the prophet, everything uh, that Islam is uh, about. But they had uh, a different way of um, finding the truth uh, than the ulama. Uh, they did not accept mostly uh, the exclusive authority of the uh, ulama. So they had their own ways of interpreting uh, scriptures uh, and getting related uh, to the uh, to the divine, uh, right? Now, um, all they do uh, because it took place in relation and, and in manifestation uh, to Islamic scriptures uh, and the broader faith tradition. Of course, uh, Sufism is part of Islamic civilization, uh, but uh, whether what Sufis say. 100% acceptable uh, to ulama is a whole different uh, matter. Uh, here, we have a few broader issues, actually. Even within Islamic law, uh, we have unacceptable views according to uh, fuqaha. Uh, for example, uh, we have uh, Shiite uh, faqih, uh, fuqaha, uh, right? Uh, whose opinions might be quite unacceptable uh, for Sunni uh, fuqaha, yet alone between uh, Sufis and Ulama. And we also know since the rise of uh, Sufia, I mean, you know, how much was hanged <laughs> um, in uh, Baghdad. Uh, so a number of Sufis were executed uh, for heretical views. Uh, they were accused for uh, disbelief. Uh, so. Discussing that is quite uh, unfruitful uh, here uh, because it's endless. Uh, it's been discussed for ages. Uh, but we know uh, that a number of um, um, beliefs and acts of Sufism was widely criticized uh, by the Fukaha, but they were hardly accused for disbelief. Uh, it's very extreme. Uh, but I know countless treatises written against uh, Sufi practices, for example, uh, the music. Uh, they, they have so many uh, treatises um, against rocks, uh, the dancing uh, of Sufis, uh, or certain um, uh, understandings of its of religion, such as Rabata, uh, the uh, authority, and their uh, interpretation of certain um, Islamic obligations, 
uh, they were widely criticized uh, by the uh, ulema, uh, but they, unless uh, they are very against uh, the word of the book, uh, they were not accused for uh, disbelief. On the other hand, uh, there were Sufi uh, groups uh, who actually accused uh, the ulema and others for disbelief, uh, and they became a lot more controversial. Uh, but uh, when we speak here, uh, we mostly speak about mainstream uh, Sufis uh, who more or less uh, became reconciled uh, with the learned tradition of uh, Islam. And we know uh, so many uh, jurists who happen to be Sufis or Sufis happen to be uh, jurists, uh, especially uh, in later Islamic uh, history. Yes. Oh. There you go. But maybe as a constructive crossover point, you should mention al because his brother was a Sufi. Yeah. And some of the Sufi thought also when he was lost, that's why he rejected um, exact sciences, uh, for instance, and philosophy, uh, with the exception of mathematics, actually, um, and supported more a spiritual way of thinking. So there was a positive uh, crossover point. I agree. Um, since uh, there is some interest about Sufi thought, do we have time, Professor Idris? <laughs> then let's make this the last question. Uh, then, yes, that's a very important uh, question. It relates uh, to other question comments uh, as well. I think one of the major disputes or controversies in the broader Islamic history is about, um, about the authority of <clears throat> knowledge uh, or epistemological uh, dispute uh, as to how do you reach the truth. Uh, in the beginning, I talked about uh, how ulema uh, thought. So ulema's take is very simple. Um, it is nakl. It's conveyed knowledge, and the only way you do is uh, to know is to educate yourself. So you know the um, instrumental skills such as uh, language, uh, logic, etc., so that you know the intention of uh, the divine, intention of the revelation, uh, by investigating into the uh, scriptures. Uh, right. On the other hand, the philosophers uh, thought. Well, uh, they said there is no difference, many of them, uh, not all of them. Uh, they thought, uh, well, there is not much difference between a prophet and a philosopher uh, because philosophers reach the same conclusion uh, as prophets through contemplation because there is only one truth for all these three categories, Sufia, philosopher, uh, and Fukaha. There, is, there are no multiple truths. Truth is one. The question is, how do you reach there, right? So ulema says, we don't know. We had to be taught. That's why um, Allah revealed the truth. And by studying the revelation, we know. Philosophers say, well, just by contemplation, we reach the same truth. We don't need nakl, uh, all these tafsir books and fuqh uh, books. These are required for the avam, uh, the common folks, because common folks are not equipped uh, with proper contemplation. Uh, they don't know the uh, techniques uh, and the, they don't have the background uh, for them. But if you have, um, Nubuva is the same as uh, philosopher, uh, the different ways of reaching the same uh, truth. Now, Sufia says, it's all about uh, God's uh, nur, uh, the being exposed uh, to that uh, light. So they think Sufi's argument is uh, the prophet's authority does not come from his knowledge. So Muhammad is not a prophet because he knew a lot. 
prophet's authority comes from his closeness, his proximity uh, to God. His wilaya, they say, is above his nubuwa. Because he was wali of God, he was exposed to the truth. And they say Muhammad was not uh, put uh, somewhere by uh, Jabrail and taught all these. No, uh, he was simply exposed that truth instantly uh, and knew the truth. As Sufia says, just like that, if you can uh, purify yourself, you can expose yourself uh, to that. Now, I'm not telling which is right or wrong, uh, but these are the three major uh, claims uh, on the uh, truth. Now, the question is, as long as those claims for truth do not conflict with each other, there is no problem, uh, right? And in most cases, they don't. Take Ibn Rushd, uh, for example. For Ibn Rushd, um, al pastor Rajam, of course, knows much better. Uh, and for him, there is not much difference between philosopher uh, and, uh, and, and the prophet. Uh, he himself, as a philosopher, uh, having thought that he reached the truth by contemplation. However, at the same time, as a uh, professional scholar, he wrote a juristic book, <laughs> became one of the most important fiqh books uh, in Islamic society. So he said, this is for awam. Uh, so if, it, if you are not equipped uh, with that, you need to uh, go with what is conveyed uh, in the tradition. But if you're equipped, then you can reach the truth uh, just by yourself. And the Sufis uh, claim that too. However, as we see in the case of Ibn Rushd, as the end product, uh, it may not matter because they all think that truth is same. But if they, uh, what they claim to be true differs from each other, then those created rifts, uh, as we see in the case of uh, Ghazali's uh, controversy with uh, philosopher or uh, the rise of Hurufis, uh, for example, is uh, one of these uh, very independent thinking, let's say Sufi uh, group uh, who completely renounced uh, learned tradition uh, and created their own uh, cosmology. Uh, and therefore they were denounced by the ulama and uh, sought after and many of them uh, were executed. So as long as the truths uh, do not conflict each other, it's not a big deal. If they do, it's a conflict. Thank you. Yes.